Vroom, vroom. <laughs> if you remember, when we bought the engine from America, there was a video of us unpacking it, and I said, oh, look, it's got a carburetor. Well, you know, I didn't really look at it that much, but since then, and since we've been decided we're going to make the car go quicker, I decided to have a look at the carburetor, and as it turned out, it's a Miller masterpiece. I mean, that is a knockout piece of kit. And I'll take a little Let bit. me see the writing. So obviously I've cleaned it up and I've looked at it. And I was very careful. When I, when I walk about with this, I hold it like it's a magneto, but you don't drop it. That is magnificent, but we'll talk about that in a second. But, good points, right? That's the float bowl. Instead of putting the float bowl there or there, which meant you have to put the carburetor on in the right direction, they put it there. So it don't matter really whether you put it on that way round or that way round, providing you've got room for it. Another really good thing, obviously, this tin cover, but underneath there is the mechanism for letting the fuel in, you know, the float pole and everything. Now, that is something, for some reason, especially on a racing car, you know, we've got to raise the float level. It, you, you're in there every five minutes, so what's he done? He's made it so you push it down and turn it like a light bulb, take that off, pull that out, and there you are. Luckily, of course, we've got something that's in absolutely fabulous condition. This has is, this is never done anything. I mean, you've only got to look at that, that little bit of wear on there, you know. It might have been on a test bed, but I don't think it's gone very far. So that's that. So then you've got the float, which again is absolutely beautiful. And then you've got two holes in there to take the fuel to the jets. One that side and one that side. <coughs> so that's a good bit of design. Right, so now we get to the bottom. I can tell you, I had to be very careful when I was um, cleaning this. It ain't, it's had a bit of bee blasting, but it's had a lot of uh, masking and a lot of care so that I didn't get it on all the bits that you don't want to get it on. But look, that's a lovely bit, right? So, and they put a little plug in there, so if you decide you want to drain the fuel or you think there might be something in the fuel or whatever, you can undo that and drain it. You can also put that anywhere from where the fuel comes in. So that's a big help. And it hasn't got a gasket. There's no gasket. Now, I don't know whether that would have had a gasket, but if it did, it would be very difficult to locate it, so I don't reckon that had a gasket. Lovely, who wants a gasket? If that don't leak, and we're going to find this out in the future, that's a miracle, right? So that's a good thing. Now, look at that lovely gauze. Absolutely as fine as fine. Held in with that clip, and then that bit unscrews, and, and that is your, obviously, your shut-off valve jet, which that goes into. So, I mean... That bit's a knockout, right? So now, we'll take this off. Now the other thing on it, I've noticed that all the little nuts are made of brass. So why did he use brass nuts? Well, we all know, if you put a brass nut on an exhaust manifold, it never falls off, it never comes loose. So you never know. He might have thought, well, brass nuts are a knockout, they don't come loose, so we'll use them. But he also put a spring washer. Right, so that comes off. Now, if you look at it, this is a casting. It's had no nonsense. That has never been scraped. It's never been filed. Look, look, that's all cast, as cast. Right? This is a typical bit of, you know, real American production, perfect. Do what's necessary and don't make a fuss, right? Now, that's never been touched. You look at that, look. 
that's never been touched, look, that's, that is cast. You put that on there, and that bit lines up with that bit. Absolutely fabulous. Can't I even pull yourself together. Right, that goes on there, and then the slow running jet goes in there. Now, when you tighten that down, you put your finger in there, and that matches. It don't match perfection, but it matches to the point where the little bit it don't match would make no difference, but it's absolutely beautiful. So that pattern work was absolutely fabulous, because there's no, there's had no work done on that tool. It's got a funny old thread here, which obviously you could screw probably a piece of rubber or something with, a, with an air cleaner. That is a problem we might have to come across. But, you know, again, it's all lovely. That pattern work was absolutely beautiful. It obviously the joint line was round there, and it's obviously had a little bit of filing where the joint line was, and then it's got a little hole there, so that if there's any fuel, it runs out. We, we and get, what, what year is this from, Ivan? I would say it's 20s, definitely 20s. Perhaps, you know, it could be even teens. So later than the engine? Possibly, but then again, it was on an engine, so, you know, that could be... That could be 1918, I don't know exactly. Because, I mean, I've got the books, but I haven't got the books on the, this particular carburetor. And I don't never read them much. I look at the pictures and, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I just don't, don't study things probably like I should do. Right, so we've assumed that's good, that's good. Now, I don't want to take that off because I've had it off. But again, if you look in there, that has never been... That's never been touched, that is just a casting. And it lines up absolutely beautiful with the machine bit of the throat bowl. Now, when we thought about putting this on, and I said to Tom, I think we might put the Sorry, seat. Sorry, hold on a sec, putting it on the, on the Hall and Scott? We're going to put this on the Hall and Scott. And I said to Tom, I think we might put the single carburetor on. And a bit like me, he thought, oh, single carburetor can't be as good as two. So what happened was, I know they've got a 33 millimetre choke because I took it off the on other the twin day, ones. On the twin ones. So I said to Tim, 33 millimetre choke twice, and then this is, I think, 52 mil, but I'll get this a thing and just measure it. This is 52 mil. No, it's nearly, no, it's 50, 54 millimetres. Anyway, I told him it was 52, so. But anyway, so he worked out a diameter of the two, worked out a diameter, and this is actually bigger than the chokes on the two carburettors. But the other thing is, this hasn't got a butterfly. They've got two monster butterflies. Talk about unstreamlined. They're about an eighth of an inch thick, and they've got two big bolts holding one. So not only has it got a little choke, but it's got to go by the butterflies, which, as I say, are monsters. Now, if you look in there, this is a barrel throttle carburetor. So when it's flat out, that's the hole you get. Now, that has got to be an advantage. It's got to be expensive. <laughs> it is, yeah. Now, the other thing about this carburetor, we're going back to the cleverness of the work that was done. This is like a Picasso, this. Maximum amount of thing, minimal amount of effort. Picasso reckon it took him a lifetime to learn how to paint like a child. And, you know, I mean, I ain't a great picture person, but that picture was the nude model. It's just a few lines, and you'd have to be an idiot not to understand what it's about. This is a similar sort of thing. It's very, very beautifully done. I mean, the pattern work, look at that round there, look. It's a millimetre or more, and that has never been touched. That was cast like that. And then they machined it, <coughs> and that was it. Now, the spindles on this thing are made of steel and they and they're ground. But they, you can't see them in there. So they've obviously got the aluminium barrel and somehow or other they fitted the spindles. Well to get all that dead in line, bloody clever, because unfortunately I've took that off. But if I could slip that back on you can see how lovely it works. Look at that. 
and then you push it sideways like that, and I reckon it's got two to three thou. It's got to have a bit of working clearance. But in there, there's nothing. It absolutely fits beautifully. And the funny thing is, I took those screws out because I wondered what was behind them. And what it is, inside there, they've got a minuscule hole, I would say 10 or 15 thou, or something like that. And what happens is you take that screw out, and there's a bit of felt in there, you put some free in one or some oil in there, and it comes out in the shaft, on the shaft, both sides look. So that's a little service thing. But you see, the thing is with that, look, it don't, you know, so when that's got a vacuum on it, it's not going to touch and make the throttle stick. That is, that is perfection. I mean, on a Bugatti Type 35, they have a 40, uh, uh, what's it called? A, a Zenith carb with a barrel throttle. And I'll tell you what, it ain't as good as that. That is just, that is just perfection. Now, the other thing is, they have a wound up spring in there, which, you know, probably works beautifully. I'll just get it. It's all intact. It's not damaged at all. And that goes in there and it winds up. Now, that is not acceptable if you go to scrutineering in this country. They have to be able to see the spring. And I'm fully in agreement with that because in a weather they've got a spring built inside the weather carburetor and they've been known to break and jam the throttle so i never have those springs in i always have a spring on the actual lever which is what the scrutineers want to see and i can understand it because you know it's a simple thing but once you've seen it, it's got a spring on the throttle and it's got to be on the arm you know, it's no good of having it on the mechanism, it's got to be on there. And I agree with that. So, reluctantly, I've taken that out because, you know, it isn't necessary to have two and there's always a chance that something might happen to that. So that's it. So that's that. Now, what happens is, it's got a line of jets down there. Now, I don't know. I don't know what's under them because I couldn't get them out. You need a special tool. And I wasn't going to put a screwdriver on them, module. So to be honest, I don't know what's in there, but I'm sure one of you lot will know because um, <coughs> you've probably read about it. So that's something I'll see in the future. So whether they're all a different size or whether there's a taper so that as the thing goes across, it sucks more fuel, I don't know. I would have said the slow running one's got to be a jet, but anyway, we'll see. So that's that, and that is just magnificent. And that there, fits it's obviously size to size because i had to warm the carburetor off push that in and then do the screws up but i'm absolutely knocked out with that i think that's absolutely beautiful and i think the whole thing is a masterpiece in design and manufacture it's fabulous so we'll see how good it is when we get it on the car but i'm confident it's going to be good now miller as far as i am concerned was the man i mean he was ahead of all of them. I mean, I know the charlatans built the overhead cam engine and I know it blew up and I know he got a chance to look at it and it must have helped him. But just like me, I look at everything, he looks at everything. But he still was a very clever bloke and he went on, he went on from the charlatans car. I mean, he made the Miller engine and the Miller cars and they're just magnificent. I mean, I'm a fan of Miller. And Bugatti must have been a fan of Miller because he, he bought a Miller, took the block off it, copied it and fit it on the top of a 35, which became a 51. And you can take the bits out of a Bugatti and they'll fit on a Miller, the cups that go on the, um, around the spark plug and things like that. So I think he was the man. And of course, he reckoned he had to do his cars magnificently. He went skint a couple of times. Because if you're in the workshop and you love what you're doing and you love the cars you're doing and you want it to be perfection, you ain't thinking about doing the bills, you're not thinking about everything. You know, some accountant works everything out, so one of them tools are going to wear out eventually and all that stuff. We don't think about things like that, we just love the cars. So 
So old Miller was a very clever man, and there's some fabulous books. Luckily, I met some, when I went to America once, I met this old boy called Hal Ulrich, who'd seen it all, race midgets, he, he really was a fabulous bloke. I would think he can't be with us now, because this was donkey years ago. But he gave me this book. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. And you've only got to look in here and look at the magnificent cars that old Miller made and the clever things he did. You know, they really, really, really is something. And the finish on them and, and the design, and they were just absolutely fantastic. I mean, look at that train of gears up the front of that engine. And he did all sorts of things. In fact, I've actually driven that car. That is a Count Sobrowski car, I think. And um, a mate of mine bought it and uh, rebuilt the engine. And I drove it around Millbrook at 120 miles an hour. And the funny thing was, when I was in the Bugatti, going around Millbrook, I had a little Type 35, flat out, it did 100 miles an hour, but you could keep it flat out. I kept it flat out for a few laps. But you were dragging it down off the banking all the time, you know, you were holding the steering wheel against it. Got in that Eckhart Berg's Miller, which was the Count Sobrowski car, and it just went round. You could have took your hands off the steering wheel. It just went round in the bowl. Now, why it did that, I don't know, because the suspension don't look that different when you it didn't look that different to a Bugatti, really. But what a bit of luck, eh, to drive the Sobrowski car round Millbrook, 120 miles an hour. You know, and the owner just said to me, oh, Eckhart said, have a go in it. Now, I know Eckhart tried the four carburettors on it. If you look at that, that's got four carburettors like that one there. And old Eckhart tried that, and he said it, it was just too powerful. He said it was much better with the two carburettors. But um, Eckhart was a very good engineer, and he tried it on the dyno and all that stuff. But what a car, I've got a fabulous picture actually, they've been following me in my um, Type 35, so perhaps I'll sort it out sometime. But anyway, there you are, you've only got to look at the pictures, I mean look at that. Now that was the car that Bugatti bought, he swapped the Type 43 for, and he copied the cylinder block off it. Because this man, I think it was Borgs, and he, he got it from... He got it from Morsheim. There were some pictures in Morsheim in about 1950 something of this car laying all covered in dust and everything. And they managed to get it and bring it back to America. And obviously they restored it like they restored everything. I mean, you know, he was, he was, he was a great man in my opinion. I feel more connected to him than... To Harry Miller? Yes. I mean, he was just terrific. Look, there's a picture of the Peugeot engine with its twin cam. And this, I think this set Miller thinking. I think this set Miller thinking. The 1913 Grand Prix Peugeot set the classic pattern and was the most widely copied in racing history. Yes. And Mr. That, Bradley. Mr. Bradley said that. But you know, I mean, what a car. He was, uh, there's a crashed. Peugeot. Your pet will look a bit iffy. Mm. But anyway, you know, so you can see I'm a real fan of Miller. I think he was a knockout. And, um, you know, I love to see things that are made like that. Not a load of fuss, not a load of difficult machining. Just made fabulous pattern making, fabulous casting. Very simple. Get on with it and get it done. And that's what that is. Right, so this is the original manifold, how the car would have come. So that would go on there like that, and the carburetor would go there. And what I did was, I took these, I turned them upside down, made that bit there, and fitted the twin cars. So I left this bit off. So now, if we're going to put the single carburetor on, we're going to have to go back. Oh, so it's this bit. Yes. I see, but upside down. You can down. see it's the right way up there, and it's yeah. the wrong way up there. Yeah. Right. So, so that's going to go on there. The single carburetor is going to go there. I'm going to make a completely new one of them. 
to work the carburetor. Now, the other thing with the carburetor is that, as I said before, we're going to leave the spring out of the carburetor and it will have a spring that you can see. So what I've decided is that when that goes on there, that's the carburetor shut and that's fully open. So luckily, that's all going in the right direction. You can see the outside springs on them, look. Oh, I see, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. so now I've got to mount the spring somewhere and I thought, well, that's going to be very difficult because I don't want a spring going to the front of the car. So what I've done is I've made up this to go on there. So that will bolt onto there, which will mean we won't need to put washers on the nuts that hold the carb on. And then, and then from there, I'll put a spring. Now I haven't finished that, I've just made it a point, but that'll get bent down, there'll be a little hole in it, and then we'll get a spring to there. So that's how that's gonna work. And um, so I made that, because I thought well, that's gonna take a bit of time. And as there's no one here and I can get on with it, I've got on with it. So there we are. So that's how we're going to do that. A decent bit of metal. Um, the... Can I ask a stupid question? Yeah, go on. In terms of getting that volume of fuel to the carb, have you got a sufficient fuel pump? Well, we'll see, won't we? I think, I mean, let's face it, it runs on them two. Yeah. So I think, yeah. I think it'll be all right, but I don't know at this stage. Now, the other thing about this carburetor, which is very clever, and it's too clever for me because I don't quite understand it, there's no way of adjusting it. There ain't any screws. There's only that screw there for adjusting the tick over. That's it. But it's got this little window here. And when I got it, it was like about there, half shut. So it's sucking air in there, and it's also sucking air in there, so you would think, well, with 10 litres, it's going to suck a lot of air. So the only way to richen it up or weaken it is to loosen that and turn it round a little bit. Seems a bit, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to say, but if it works, it's a bleeding miracle because it's a bit simple, isn't it? So we'll put that on there. We'll drive it up the road. Let's hope it progresses nicely because, you know, I mean, the thing is, if... if if it don't pick up nicely, that's another problem, but we'll try it, we'll see. And then obviously we look at the plugs and bugger about a bit and eventually move that and see if we can get the mixture right. I mean, I don't know, but listen, it was Harry Miller. I'm going to put my money on him. I think it'll be all right. So that's it. So that has to be cleaned up. That will go back like that. We'll have the piece of metal like that and then it, that'll get bent down and a spring fitted, so that'll be Can nice. Can I ask another question? Yeah. With that new manifold, will the bonnet shut? Will it fit? Oh, yes. Yes, it, all, it, it had a single carb on it when I first did it. Oh, OK, OK, OK. It was only when I bought the th second engine that it had one of them carburettors, and I thought, well, we don't want that sitting on the bench. Let's get it on the car. OK. So that's what we did. But I'm not saying it was a genius move, but, you know, let's see where this goes. I think this could, well, this is bigger. Yeah, that choke, size matters. That choke there is bigger. <laughs> well, so they say. <laughs> but, you know, it's the finesse, I think, not the size. That's One of my followers is obviously looked at all this very like I look at it all, he suggested that some bloke in America modified the car that stayed in America, he boxed in the conrods and raised the compression and got it going a lot better. Now whether that was the car that blew up or not, I don't know. But anyway, I thought, well yeah, he's right really, we've got to get some compression, you know, but you can't alter the barrels because they're dead thin here. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't machine a bit off the barrels and drop them down. You've got to order the pistons. Now, the pistons have got bloody old-fashioned piston rings. Um, you know, they're about, oh, you know, they're nearly a quarter of an inch thick. I'll show you some. We've got some in there. Um, so we've got a race of compression. So I'm thinking, well, we'll have some pistons made. we we'll get them made in Australia or wherever, and blah, 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 and we'll have to make a drawing, or we'll have to send them, to, I don't know, it all seemed like a drama to me. So I'm watching the old internet, like we all do, and I'm watching the blokes in India. 
Well, you can't believe it. They make this piston down here to make one, so they cut the piston in off. They used the old piston as a core box for the inside of the new one. It was a right old bodge up, but they did it and they machined it. And everybody said that at the end, the piston that they showed us was not the piston they made, which is quite possible. I wouldn't argue with that. And we don't have to be as rough as them. We could make a proper pattern. So this is what I've got in my mind. So we're now going and I'll show you what I'm thinking of doing, which may seem a bit nutty, but I think it'll be all right. Right, so there are the conrods in the hall in Scott. And as you can see, they're not a bad job, are they? Lovely and stiff. I don't think we'd be boxing them in, because I would never uh, dream of doing so. Are these yeah. from the engine that came from the States last year? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And exactly the same as the one that's in the car. Now, one of the problems with these is, it has a pin that holds the gudgeon pin. And I think, on one of our engines, it, it worked loose, and it caused a load of aggravation. But, they're still lovely pins, so if we made a set of pistons ourselves, we could chop those down, put a bit of a, bit of a radius on them, and we could use um, wire clips in the piston, which in my opinion is a lot better, and it's what all modern cars have, so I reckon that'd be good. So we've got the gudgeon pins, we ain't got to make them, we just chop them down a little bit, and they're in lovely condition. Now one of the pistons in this engine, which is the engine, obviously we've got some bits to look at, is very crabby. Right, no, that's a good one. That's a good one. There it is. Look, you can see how it's been, you know, um, corroded away and then you can see the fat piston rings well obviously you wouldn't need to have fat piston rings like that right so let's say we decide to make some pistons we can get on the cops and ask them to find us some piston rings out of a lorry or something we'd like to get modern piston rings if we could get them but this is an original piston ring that we made a fixture up we machined it and we reduced it down and that we put that one on the bottom and then we machined a groove in there and drilled holes in it and that stopped it smoking. So that really worked. So if the worst comes to the worst, we could always use, we've got enough piston rings, we could always use original piston rings and reduce the size down to that. But if we can get modern piston rings, we we'll get modern piston rings. Right, so this is what they did in India. If you look inside there, that, would mean a core in the mould because it you can't pull that out. You could make it so you could just pull the sand out. But that's rather nice that the fact that it only got that boss and the, you know, it's a heavy piston but it would be a lot heavier if that was solid in there. So what I've got in my mind is chopping that in half and using and obviously that would need to be built up because that's been machined. But using that as the core box, so we'd incorporate that in a lump of wood and then we put a core print on here which locates it in the mould, the other bit of the mould which will look like just a, a block really and then we put a lump on there that we can machine off so we can set the compression ratio and um, so that'd be how we would raise the compression. Now, we'd probably do a dummy build with one of our cylinders, cover that all in grease and put some rings in it, push it in the cylinder to the mark where it goes to, and then we can get a barrette reading so we know how many cc's it is, so then we can work out the compression ratio of the original car, and then we can say, well, we want to make it whatever, and all we've got to do then is go and tune in for speed, and it gives you the it gives you the formula to work out the size of the bore and let us say, to make it six to one or seven to one, we need to put 20 mil, 10 mil, five mil, I don't know. But anyway, that's my idea of making the thing right. So now if we got that done, Timothy has pistons made, oh, sorry, 
cast his my fire firm because there's lots of bits in the brigade that are made of aluminium and he hasn't made so we've got a pretty good rapport with the people i reckon if i was to chop that up and make a core box and make a pattern we could go to them and say knock us four of these up or let's do five because we're obviously going to make a mistake aren't we i reckon they do them for us a bit lively now if they did it for us lively we could then set about machining them i'd have a lump put on there so you could hold that in the lathe and you could do all of that, everything done. And then obviously you just chop the lump off and then you can put that in the lathe and you could set the compression ratio. So we could do, so before we take it out of the lathe, we could do the rings, we could do the thing, right? Now the other thing is, it's not round. And you can see those bits there, look, that's all to help it. So when it expands that way, don't see it. But we could put it in the fore jaw raise it up a little bit and then just machine that bit away there to, to, to get the ovality right and obviously we measure it all John loves a bit of measuring so he can measure all that and machine it now the only thing I'm a little bit doubtful about is machining the gudgeon pin hole now obviously we can make a fixture up we can put that in the mill and we can go down there with a boring bar but it's a terrific finish in there so that's something we'd have to think about. I haven't got that in my mind at the moment. Whether we'd have to have a, I don't know, a, a, a honing tool or something, but we'll think of something. So my idea would be, between now and Goodwood, we rip the barrels off and we put new pistons in it with a bit more compression. Bit ambitious, but it don't matter because at least we get new pistons being made, which is what we've got to have it eventually anyway. So that's my idea at the moment. Now the other thing that's wrong with a car, it slings its oil out. Now I think what's happening there is, I never thought about it before, but the volume of the sump, when you've got two and a half litre pistons going up and down, the load of volume in the sump, it gives it a chance to sort of go somewhere. But if you've cut the sump off and made it dry sump, then obviously it isn't got anywhere to go. But in theory, your dry sump pump should be sucking the air out of the oil and air out of the sump and should make it better. But I'm not so sure that it's working. So that's another thing I'm going to check. I'm going to take the pipes off. I'm going to run the car. I'm going to take the pipe off that goes to the um, sucking out pump and see how much oil comes out and see how much it's got. Because I think we've got it. we're going to have to evacuate the air out of the sump at some stage so that's another little thing i've got to think about and obviously we've got to cure oil leaks one of the oil leaks is i'll show you i'll show you that because it's quite interesting when we was at goodwood john said to me what should i get on with so i said well that engine that we bought is all lying in pieces in the back of that old pickup i said i'm a little bit worried about it so i said get the bits out and start cleaning them up so old john has this is as far as he's got, he's cleaned all that lot up. But this is the rocker, right? So that goes on there like that. Let's find one it fits, right? So that goes on there. No, it don't go that way, and it goes that way around. Right, so that's got a roller on it, rolling on the can. Now the only thing, now that is smothered in oil. That is like in a bath of oil. So you can imagine when it's going around, it's splashing everywhere. Now the only oil seal it's got is a bit of felt in there. Now I've bought the felt and I've replaced it. I've done it double. I've tried every angle and it still comes out there a bit. So I reckon there's too much oil in there. So that's another thing we've got to think about. But also there's nothing there around there. So, so if it really is flooded, this is going to expand and the oil's going to come out there. So what we thought, or what I thought of doing was getting these on the mill and fitting an O-ring in there so that when you put them together, obviously you wouldn't have much sticking up because it would just shear it off. But anyway, get it in there with the O-ring. So that would cure that. And then our felt along there, we're going to have another workout. I don't know what we're going to do. We could finish up with an O-ring. I don't know, but we think of something. So that's that. But, so the oil rushes down there, it comes out of the mains, which are them, in there. The oil comes out of there, floods into there, floods into there, floods into there, and then it all runs down the end here, 
and it goes out of that little tube. Well, that ain't big enough. So what we did on the other engine, we've made that bigger. But I think we've got to make it bigger still. Because it ain't going to drain through there, because there's a bearing in there. There's a bearing in there, which obviously is where the shaft comes up. There's the shaft there. That comes up from the, um, from the crankshaft to drive the cam wheel. I don't know if it's that, no, it's that way around. That's how it goes like that and drives the thing. So, you know, it's, um, it's got a tortuous path to get by there to get down into the engine. So I think we're going to have to think about that. Because I think, you see, the thing is with this, if it's an aeroplane engine, bloke starts it up, maximum revs is 1400 RPM, probably uses that to take off, but he don't go 1400 RPM all the time, he's rolling along at 800,000 RPM. Got the great big sump, so there's plenty of room for the air to go. It's got the tiniest fuel, water, oil pump you've ever seen. I mean, it is ridiculously small. I think it had 14 PSI. Well, we've been running it a bit more than that, obviously, with our dry sump pump. So that's another angle we've got to think about. We could reduce the oil pressure, because it doesn't actually... It's quite a funny system, actually. Let me show you. What happens is pressure fed to the mains so, so the oil comes up from the main into there. No, tell a lie. It's, fresh, it's, it's pressure fed to the mains. There's no holes in there, so it can't go up like that. So all the oil that runs out of there, it runs up the side of there and it gets caught in this little duct here. So the oil comes out of there and runs into there and then this is hollow, so it's got quite a big hole. So I would say half of that is full of oil which is being collected from there. So it's not pressure fed. It wouldn't be difficult to make it pressure fed because all you'd have to do, you'd have to drill a few holes here and there and everywhere. But you know, I don't think it's necessary. It seems to work all right. And I think if I went to all that trouble, we'd have to think about having a new crank made that would be counterbalanced. So you'd have a proper counterbalance bit on there. And unfortunately, old Dave Wood's a man who designed the crankshaft in my um, Alvis is no longer with us, so I don't know who to get to do that now. Because Dave Woods would have done that beautifully. And then we could sort out the uh, thrust. So when you push the clutch out, we could have it, the thrust on the main bearing instead of having all that nonsense with the bearing. And then we could have the crankshaft made with the bit at the back to put the flywheel straight on instead of a separate bit. So that would be the way to go. And then obviously we'd have new rods made and then we'd have new pistons, and, and then I'll be skint. So I don't think that's going to happen. So I think we've got to make the best of what we've got, and I think making our own pistons would be a good move. I think it'd be interesting for the thing. There's going to be out, people out there who know a lot more about all this than me, so they're going to say, oh, you need a so-and-so for doing that. And obviously we'll take your advice, because, you know, two heads are better. No, 20... Nearly 21,000 heads are better than one. Is that right, oh, Susie? That's right. What's it, 20.9 or something? And nearly 21,000. Yeah, yeah. So all them blokes out there, well, we've got to use them if we can. Because there are probably a lot of them, a lot cleverer than me. I'm just a bloke who gets it all together, I hope. But anyway, we'll see. Right, so we've got 20.9,000 followers. So, you know, I'm not saying all of them are going to watch it. And I'm not going to say all of them are engineers. But listen. If you've got any advice, give it to us. I'm easily contactable because we want to get more followers. It would be nice to have a million followers, but I doubt that will ever happen, but it would be nice. And I've tried to talk Susie into having a wet T-shirt thing, but she won't have it, so we ain't going to get a million followers like that. I think that's the end. Don't forget to subscribe.